Good to see you, Mr. Brady. Great to be here. Uh, yes. uh, I want you to go ahead and state your name real quick. Okay. My name is Leon Alexander Brady. Leon Alexander. I never knew your middle name. I knew the, I knew the A, <laughs> Leon A. Brady. Uh, so uh, we, want to, we want to find out a few things about you. Um, first of all, tell me where you're from. Okay, I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana. I lived there until I was 17. Went into the Air Force. Spent four years in the Air Force. Uh, came out of the Air Force and went back to school. Received my bachelor's and master's degree from Tennessee State University. And then went on to teach. What I'm still doing. Uh, what year were you born, if I, if I, if I may ask? Sure, I'm proud of it. 1932. I'm 82 years old. Okay, and uh, type of neighborhood you grew up in, what, you know, was it mixed or was it? Uh, there was no mixing at that particular time. <laughs> uh, it was all black. Uh, I guess you would sort of call it like a ghetto also. Uh, that's why I say it when I tell people, I mean, never be negative on where you were born because that's a part of who you are. Uh, matter of fact, when we went to New Orleans, I had the buses to drive into my neighborhood so the students could see where I came from because where you come from a lot of time is basically who you are and I'm proud of that. What did you uh, like doing when you were growing up? Well my childhood wasn't very much a childhood to a degree. I started working when I was 10 years old. My um, mother and dad separated and uh, I did several things. I, Giant shoes, worked, worked in the bowling alley, cat it. Uh, this is why I have such a strong background in those different things because naturally be, being on the golf course, I mean, you have to, you learn as much as you caddy um, to the extent of after you're there for so long, a lot of times the golfers are asking you what irons to you, woods to you. So, it gave me a broad background at a very young age, and I learned at that age you have to work to get what you really want. And that's what I try to push on to my students today. Did you have brothers and sisters? I had one brother. He died before I even knew, um, I don't know, knew of him. Uh, I didn't have any sisters. So. Uh, did you do any music when you were uh, <laughs> as a kid? <laughs> No, unfortunately, uh, the, the things of that nature wasn't really there. When I say there, uh, we weren't fortunate enough to have a financial situation to a music as, as such as a youngster. Now, I asked, after I got a little older and I went to high school, I played drums in high school. And basically, that started when I was very young. Just drawn to the, the, the drums. Um, picked up drumsticks at a very young age, and I used to beat all the time. Matter of fact, um, I was in trouble a lot because I don't know if they had any pots and pans left of the cookout of, because most of them probably had holes in them. Because that's that was my drum. That's what my drum set was, and uh, I was inspired by um, several of the percussionists in that area. Uh, went to nightclubs. I used that literally <laughs> outside of nightclubs to listen in, and I was all uh, Edward Blackwell, was mm -hmm. one of the top drummers at that particular time. And I think he saw me outside or something, and we sort of got together. I was n n really young, and he was. And um, matter of fact, I made contact with him after I got out of the service, and he's passed now. So. What high school was it that you went to? Regular high school. Was it, I mean, you remember the name of it? Booker T. Washington. Oh, okay. Yeah. Probably already said that, but <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, so once you went to uh, college, is that where you started to uh, get more into the uh, education and the music? No, I have to give credit where credit is due. I, I got a lot of my experience in the Air Force. Uh, it was amazing. I got into the Air Force really accidentally to a degree. 
um, most of you all are too young to remember that, but it was the old Army Air Force. And then when the Air Force decided they were going to split, um, then they formed the Air Force. Then they were asking people, uh, guys and girls, in, in the Army, would they be interested in moving over to the Air Force? And I, I naturally, I was probably one of the first in to, to say yes for the simple reason I didn't like the Army uniforms. The Air Force uniforms were blue, blue and pretty and had the cap that was, so I've always been interested in the way I look. So I went to the Air Force and uh, they had auditions. Naturally, uh, with my experience in high school with drums, naturally I wanted to go into music. And uh, that's when I really started really digging down into music and learning that you don't have to be a drummer. You can become a percussionist. That's when I learned timpani and xylophone and rhythm and other books like that. So I have to really give the Air Force credit for that. So when I went to college, naturally I had that background. Uh, plus I was on scholarship and, and naturally with, um, by being in the Air Force, naturally I had that amount of money behind me. So I spent three years, my first three years, and I received my bachelor's degree and I went back as a matter of fact, continue, I got my master's degree. And I have 18 hours left for a PhD, which I've never taken the time because I've always been more interested in what I was doing than going back to school for a PhD. Uh, when did you get into the jazz end of it? That started in the Air Force. Matter of fact, I have pictures of several Air Force bands. Matter of fact, we were in Goose Bay, Labrador, and Thule, and uh, we would play, you know, as the troops were coming off, off the ships and so forth. And uh, I had some beautiful experiences with um, several musicians that became great. And uh, naturally, I've forgotten some of the names, but uh, that's the way I got my inspiration. In other words, if they can do it, I can do it. So I continued. And my, my whole focus has always been on teaching. Uh, I believe that. Almighty put me down here for that reason, to teach young people, kids, basically. Yeah. Uh, it seems like you are, you know, you told me whatever you played with some some of the big guys, Ray Charles, some other people that were out there uh, at some point. Oh yeah. Uh, what, what is? I mean, can you tell me a little bit about some of the those type guys you were involved with? Well. An interesting thing, really. Uh, I not had an opportunity to play with uh, Roy Brown, Pete uh, Crawford, uh, more with people like Clark Terry, uh, because uh, I went on a job with him, and it was really strange because the way it happened. Uh, he was, we were talking about pay, and I, I asked him, you know, could I take my pay for him coming to the school that I was teaching, which was Sumner? And he said yes, and he, he came to Sumner almost every summer. We played together every summer. And uh, that's where a lot of my students got some experience that I, I would not, I could not teach them. Double tongue, triple tongue, I can tongue. <laughs> not the double and the triple. So uh, that those are some of the things that, when I say born to teach, those are some of the things I mean, not just me teaching, but finding out how I can put my kids in a situation where they, they're learning, and not just normally learning from me. Um, we had Wynton Marcellus to come in, uh, and um, Max Roach. Yeah. Um, like I say, it's, it's, it, as I talk, it's, it's coming back, but probably not fast enough for the interviews. Oh, that's fine. I mean, you didn't do any teaching outside of the Kansas City uh, before then, did you? No. So, uh, when did you move to Kansas City then? 1959. Oh, wow. That's what it was. And I taught uh, in, in Northeast until I was asked to move to Sumner, and I taught 
and that summer from 1966 to 1976, which at that particular time, there were some things that I didn't agree with, so I resigned and uh, opened a music store. Okay, I want to I, I get into some of that or whatever, but uh, first of all, then let's go back to Northeast. Mm -hmm. uh, when you first started teaching there, did, you know, what did you bring to the music department? Well, I like to think I brought quite a bit because uh, at that particular time I was teaching strings also. So we had an orchestra, we had a band. We, Northeast was probably one of the first, well, I want to say probably as far as I know, uh, one of the first bands to march. Uh, we start, the youngsters start learning how to march and play marches and parades and so forth. And I think that was one of the reasons I was asked to, to move to summer because I was very fortunate that I had some students that I was with at Northeast for three years. When I moved to Sumner, I was with those students for three years. So, I mean, I don't know if they got tired of me or not, but I really enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, I remember that Horace was one of them. Yeah. Horace and uh, George Robinson were two guys that used to tell me about their experiences of following you all the way through. <laughs> uh, I remember us having conversations. He used to tell me that uh, while you were teaching us at uh, Northeast, Maybe it's something, but um, you were also working with Mr. Buckner. Y'all had a little jazz oh, group yeah. that used to do some things and some some clubs, and some of the stuff was a little crazy where it got a little rowdy. And now tell me some of that experiences. Well, yeah, I played in some places that really was a little on the other side to a degree. But and this is what I try to explain to my kids: you don't have to do what someone else is doing. You do what you really feel that's right to do. Uh, you remember the group name? I mean, you remember the members of the group? I know Reginald Buckner was one, Reginald right? Buckner. He played what? Uh, what did Reggie play? Buckner. He played organ, or was it organ, piano? Bo a little of both. Okay. Same thing with uh, Betty and Mill A. I was with them uh, on troops for quite some time. Okay. And uh, so I've had so many experiences until. I, mean, I, I feel blessed. I'm still blessed. And, and I'm trying to remember all of them. Uh, you told me of one incident, I think somebody shot and you took the symbol. And, uh, one of the reasons for me using a 22 inch symbol even now, because it saved my life, uh, was in one of the clubs. As, we, as I said, it wasn't really always the nicest club. But uh, there was an incident and a guy pulled a gun and just shot. And what, what saved me, I don't mean it was directed at me or coming to me were really saving me with my 22 inches symbol that I put on That's why I tell my students all the time, you don't have to do what somebody else is doing. I mean, whether you know it's right or wrong. Um, and sometimes you're going to be in situations that you may not be in control of. But if you keep your brain going, your mind going, and think, matter of fact, in my studio, that's the biggest word you see when you walk into my studio. The word think it's about me. And if I can get all my students to do that, 90% of what's happening to them will be positive. Okay, uh, I know you're known for uh, pushing the envelope and for uh, challenging your students. What's some of the type of materials you used to have your, uh, your students play at the, uh, what, the middle school or as they call it now? I know you had had us playing like some, was it Parade of the Charities and, and uh, Blues in 6-8 and all different kind of things that were really on a college level. Uh, you, you know, what what made you do things like that? I've always believed that a person can do anything they really want to do. And those are the things that I grew up in. In other words, there is no limit when I say limit. You push a youngster as far as you can push him. And in most cases, he will go where you push him. And some of those things um, that we did in, in middle school, I mean, most people say high school, some say college. But music has no limit, and that's, that's what I go by. In other words, you can do what you want to do. I mean, you shouldn't be limited by race, by age, uh, those type things. I mean, you want to do it, you want to do it badly enough, you can do it. And, and uh, see, you also wound up getting a lot of the community behind you, uh, supporting you in 
in, in, in having your students and taking your students out of this area so that they could see more and experience more of what's in the world. Uh, did you do that at Northeast too? Yes. Okay, and then you moved, moved on to Sumner at what year? 1966. Some of the ten years, nineteen sixty-six to nineteen seventy. And then that's when you kind of brought the same thing to some there, only try to step it up a little bit, you know, to where you pushed it even hard, harder. Much, much harder, because the capabilities and the abilities grow with, with children. Almost with anybody, if you let it. But with children, you never know how far they can go. Just push as hard as you can, and trying to make it happen. So the marching techniques, you know, where did you develop them from? Tennessee State. Oh yeah? Fortunately, I was older than, oh, I'm not older, I was more advanced than a lot of the students when I went to college because I was in the Air Force. So I was older than some of the students in college. So when I got there, fortunately, they, they uh, recognized the, the potential that I had and I was in charge of the drum line and and this type of thing. So um, we started doing things that I had done in college. So that's, that's basically how that started. So the marching was a new thing. Well, not a new thing at Tennessee State, but a new thing for Kansas. For Kansas, for Kansas. We, it was called high stepping. Yeah. And I was always against just walking. In other words, if a band is in the parade and they're walking, I mean, I have nothing against it. That's what the band director you know, expects. But I, I, I never saw that because when, when we marched in parades, we marched like we marched on the field. And that gained a lot of attention in this area. Well, I know some of that, a lot of that has to do too with uh, your military training and all that because you brought that into the high school to where I know the discipline on us was really tough <laughs> to, you know, to where we were, you know, it, it was, we were scared. <laughs> you know? well, but, but at the same time, you know, we we wanted it bad too and, st and you instilled that in us too. Um, and that was a time period where if they didn't do what, I mean, if you spanked them, then when they went home, they were going to get spanked by their parents <laughs> because right. you had to spank them. <laughs> well, and I, 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 I try it always and I still do make sure that I'm totally in touch with the parents. And I tell my, my students now, uh, well, they already know, but I don't have a problem going to your house. And those are, those were my beliefs as far as an instructor is concerned. I mean, now because a lot of instructors are not in the community, per se, which that's the way things are going. But if I live in that community, I'm a part of that community. So if a student did not do what I was expecting them to do, uh, I went to your house. And your mom and your dad or your uncle and your brother or whatever, because that's the way I was raised. I was raised by a community. And unfortunately, we have less of that. I mean, and I know because a lot of people are busy and they have so many things going on, but I try never to be too busy for my children. I have very, very beautiful children. Uh, two young men and one daughter. Matter of fact, my granddaughter is graduating in June be there for her. So I try to, I was there for my children and I wanted to make sure I was there for my children because they were a part of my life. When I say my children, that meant my students. You were married, uh, how many times were you married? Two many. <laughs> <laughs> and your kids and stuff, were they involved in music at all? My son plays trumpet. He still does. Uh, he practices uh, sporadically. Because he's always, he's, he's always on the move. That's why they never went in, into music, per se. Uh, it's a, it's a, you have to dedicate yourself to that particular thing. If you're not going to dedicate yourself to that particular thing, then it's just enjoyment. But the true musician is dedicated to what he's doing. He's going to put time on that, irregardless to what else is happening. I tell my kids that all the time. I practice all the time. When are you going to have time? I have my sticks and my practice bag. And as long as you're committed to that, I mean, it's, it's, it's always going to go forward. Your other son and daughter, what do they do? My, my oldest son, again, both my sons are in Chicago. One plays trumpet and the other one plays cello. Matter of fact, he still takes cello lessons. Uh, my daughter plays piano. 
And my grand granddaughter has a Rett syndrome, so she she she's not capable of holding six to playing piano, but she loves music. She loves her granddad. You know, so I have to stick that in. <laughs> Yeah, no, I want you to, uh, you know, that's one reason I asked this question, because I know they'd be like, oh, you didn't say nothing about us. <laughs> yeah, and they know I always do, matter of fact, I'm getting ready to go there in June, in June with my grand, with grandbaby. I can't tell you. She'll give me. My granddaughter's graduated from high school. And my daughter is the same as her dad. People tell her all the time, that, that can't happen. The child can't have red syndrome. And she has proved it. Uh, so I know you used to make us run 10, 14 laps or something like you know. Oh, you were lucky. And if you were in the early and we, we, we went up to 20, 30, 40, or 50. <laughs> because first of all, that's the physical. Because I try to develop the mental part through the music skill. But if you're not in shape physically, no matter what you do, you're not going to be able to do it. And if you made, made no, a lot of times I was out in front and I still run. You had us standing out there uh, in, this, in the suit, in the 80, 90 degree weather and stuff at attention mm -hmm. for a long, I mean, you know, 10, 10, 15 minutes or whatever, mm -hmm. just standing there and don't move, you know, until people were almost passing out. I know a lot of that was conditioning, uh, but you also took us to where we had to compete against uh, uh, like Lincoln University and, and Grambling and all of them would come in town and we were... Uh, marching in the uh, American Royal and things with those same, <laughs> and you wanted us to outplay, you used to make the drummers. If I couldn't hear you a block over, yeah. you had some problems. And used to, I, I remember you used to reward them if they busted their head. Oh yeah. <laughs> five bucks, that, five bucks at that particular time, a little more than it is now. So I mean, and that's where the difference comes in between a drummer and a percussion. Mm -hmm. When you're out on the field, you're out on the street, you're a drummer because you're playing one instrument, you're supposed to be able to control that instrument. So I shouldn't be able to, I should be able to hear you as far away as humanly possible. And those, those type things, like you say, standing in heat and stuff, the reason for that, and I never really just gave that to the student, I didn't feel I needed to explain what I'm doing because I knew what I was doing and I knew it was best for my kids. Uh, when we went to New Orleans, we had the longest parade that anybody basically had ever been in. We were the only, one of the only bands that was asked to play in, on national television in front of a reviewing place. And that came because my students were in physical shape. It was like a five and a half mile march. And they were physically, mentally capable of doing it. And those are the things that most people even don't look at, but they play you know, on national television. That's something that just didn't happen. Yeah, I know uh, uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, be in the band that opened up both the, the marching band that opened up uh, Arrowhead Stadium right. and the jazz band that opened up uh, the baseball stadium, at, uh, which is what, called, you know, whatever they call it, uh, opened up the baseball stadium too uh, in the jazz band uh, that, that went to Paris and stuff. Uh, so uh, tell us a little bit about getting into the, you know, creating the jazz band. I don't know if, uh, did something have an orchestra? Uh, yes. It wasn't as, uh, not like Northeast. Yeah, it wasn't the same as Northeast. I'm not, uh, uh, but you focused more on the jazz band and the marching band on it. And, and so the jazz band was a band that you took to many competitions. It, it started with, uh, just local competitions and then it went into national competitions and eventually international competitions. Well, we started basically uh, in the area. We did uh, the Topeka Jazz Festival every year. Matter of fact, we won it nine years straight. And uh, after that, well, we went to different other, actually different other places. We were invited to play for several of the other high schools at their big festival. There is no limit with me. It's limited by mentality a lot of times. By that I mean you're too young, you're too old, you're white, you're black. I mean, music has no boundaries. 
Yeah, a musician is a musician. In in us going to, I'm, I'm a member of the uh, the band that went to Paris, uh, and we were representing the whole country uh, uh, in the International Jazz Festival in 1972. Uh, he went through some political things and and some different things uh, uh, during that time in order to get us. I know you always were going through. You were fighting the, uh, the boards and city boards and and the whole uh, school boards and everything that was going on. Uh, can you talk a little bit on some of that politics that you went through? I think it should be out there. Yeah. Well, see, I have beliefs. And I, I'm very emphatic about that. I mean, the, the, the things that I believe in, and I don't feel that there should be limits on a lot of things. And I was told that we could not go to Peppers. And my question was, why? I mean, that's in my vocabulary. That's one of the main things that went with my kids. I didn't practice. Why? I didn't do this. Why? Give me a reason, and if it's a reasonable reason, then I can accept it. But uh, to be told no. Couldn't go, so I went to the community, you know, because I was told, you know, it's a financial thing. You know, there's no money. Paid. So I went to the community, and people like me, the Swishy and several others on the community committee, uh, we raised the thirty thousand dollars that we needed to go. So we ended up in Paris. In Paris, what you know, what transpired, or the, you know, with the competition? I'll let you say it. Yeah, I'd like I'd like for you to say it. because you you can then I see I'm, I'm putting you on this spot. <laughs> uh, from from the standpoint of a, a director, I mean a, a band director or whatever you, you label you for the person. I think that was one of the highlights. Well, you took you know you took your family with you too, and uh, you took all these how many kids were there? I don't remember. Me too. Yeah, and we went uh, to mm -hmm. London and Paris. We stayed in combination in both places for two weeks and uh, you had us in jazz workshops you know so we had to get up in every morning or whatever and go to these workshops all day and, and work on them and then we would go into the competition later on uh, but we wound up taking first place uh, representing the country and I know that was a that was a big moment and then you came back here and with that same band decided to uh, take us in a studio, a recording studio, and record, document that that band and stuff. You know. The studio was called what? The Cave, was it? The Cavern. The Cave, when we, when we did it there, that, that, was, that was the band that in the area that was recording. And this was sort of something special. And, uh, and I felt it should be, because that was, one, that was the first. Not just first for some of them, but as far as I know, I don't know of any other band that's gone into the international jazz competition. Yeah. Not, not, that's me saying that. I don't know, maybe it's All right, uh, after, uh, so you stayed with Sumner till what year? 76. 76, and then you wound up leaving Sumner. Uh, can you say why? Yeah, to do my own thing. What I was doing that summer, I was doing my thing. And got to the place where it was not tolerated, appreciated, whatever word you want to use. You can't stop me. So I opened the music store. Started teaching, did some of the same thing. Matter of fact, the, the, uh, those kids in, in, uh, in my studio, <clears throat> we have about 175 or 80 trophies now from at that time. When we, we went into competition in different places, MA, MA, and so forth. My kids always accelerate. So you uh, always I mean, maintain the teaching, right, Through, throughout, even to this day, right now. Uh, but then somewhere in within that teaching, uh, after you left Sumner, you created a jazz band, a Kansas City Youth Jazz Band, and you wound up taking them into the same competition that you used to take Sumner into, right? Uh, can you talk a little bit about that organization? Well, I founded the Kansas City Youth Jazz Band because it was a continuous. In other words, what I saw was sort of a, a changing that was happening as far as someone was concerned, which later everyone 
my daughter became some of the cabin. Um, sometimes you have visions, and that's why I say I think the Almighty decided that's to be one of you to teach young people. And I saw something that was sort of becoming negative, so I created something that was positive. So, uh, you know, the, the, the band won several trophies. We ended up playing with people like uh, Marilyn May and Linton Moss Ellis and Clark Terry again, because Clark came back. We, we, stayed, we stayed friends until he passed. And then Winton goes, goes back, <clears throat> because I'd love, love to just say, well, I knew Winton, I knew I didn't, I knew his father. So he's there from New Orleans. I made that contact and went and came in and uh, clinic the band. It was, it was a funny thing. He's probably going to laugh when he sees this, this video or whatever we're doing. Uh, I asked him to come over. We were at one of his concerts. And I always had my students to go to the concert, whatever kind of different concerts. So we were at the concert. We went backstage and I asked him if it was possible to come in uh, to uh, the band, so I tell me some ideas, and naturally as busy as he is, I said, well, I don't, you know, my schedule is pretty busy, pretty busy. I said, well, think about it, and if you get some opportunities, and you come in. So, um, the way things work, and I tell my students this all the time, it's nice to be nice to everyone, you know, because you're not, you don't ever know when it's going to be a payback. It's all, it's all payback. What you do, you get paid back. If it's bad, you're going to get paid back bad. If it's good, you get paid back bad. Good. So his drummer had taken lessons from one of the students that I taught when I was at Tennessee State. And naturally, that was that one. So uh, the, the, next, the next day, I think it was the next day or two, I think it was the next day, um, we got a call and we said, this is when myself so I was invited to create the band. I found time. Well, I sort of knew the finding time was good too, but it's always that input. So naturally, the drummer came with it. So the drummer took my, my drum kids and he took the wind and put it all together. And uh, um, the band directors were saying, what I found out is Never let the students know what is going to happen. It should be a surprise because then you have the lead way and the leverage you say, think about it if you had practice more. Because a lot of the students were sort of upset when we didn't tell them when it was coming. Shouldn't have to. You should be doing what you're supposed to do. So that, that, that just fuses my beliefs and, and, and concepts of what teaching is all about. That's why I said it's all my head to have. I couldn't do all that. I mean, you know, I'm not somebody who gave me that kind of input and yeah, and and that. Well, I know uh, you you fought off a lot of uh, negative things that happened, like I know the transitions and whatever, uh, like going from Sumner to going to Sumner Academy. They destroyed a lot of the uh, works you you had uh, awards and film and and other things, right, uh, that was going on. And similarly, when you left that organization that you uh, put together, the Kansas City Youth Jazz, uh, Jazz Band, uh, was there any type of reason why they had let you loose from that organization? Well, it was basically, I like think, political also. In other words, you know, in, in a lot of situations, they look at age factors and those mm -hmm. type things. In other words, uh, I was getting up in age and I guess they figured, well, I, the, the guy that took over uh, taught, uh, taught for me when I was on Minnesota. And I uh, won't use names, but taught for me when I was on Minnesota. And naturally, when I when I started the band, I thought of him first. He came in and helped. He was one of the teachers though. So he was a younger guy. So I guess they figured, well, you know, if, um, 
you can do that, and you're getting kind of old. We would like for you to just pass the torch. Left. And I'm one of those old fashioned people. You've been, you've been knowing me almost all your life. Uh, I stay at where I want it. I'm not want it. You know. Yeah, that's so much. I'm bleak. Northeast was different. I was asked to come to something by the principal. So that, was, that wasn't, I got tired of that one. I felt move up because I was, was losing students to the degree I would teach. Northeast, and then they would go to some, and for some reason they either would get out of the van or something. I don't know, I never really went into why. But like I said, when I went from Northeast to Summer, I had kids for six years, three years, Northeast and three at Summer. So with the jazz band, um, KCYJ, it was time for me to leave. Yeah. So then I left, and uh, My so own, my own studio. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. What are you doing now? I, I, I still teach. I just said do it. I plan on teaching until they decide it's time for me to stop and come up. They would get a girl. And, <laughs> so uh, you're teaching elders and young folk, young folk now, right now, aren't you? I had my last group that I had, and I moved from there. Uh, the youngest was 82, and the oldest was 97. Well, my same philosophy and belief is, um, Craig, you're never too young, you're never too old. I mean, as long as, as long as the Almighty permits you to stay on this earth, you can do whatever you want to do. You may not be able to do it as fast or as long, but you can still do it. What age group on kids are you teaching? I have students from 4 to 17. Wow. And I have adults from, I think, So, Mr. Brady, uh, if you're speaking to youngsters, elders, every, just everybody in general and stuff, what are some of the things you would like to tell them or like to, what kind of advice can you give? How would you like to be remembered? Just, and, you know, uh, any of that kind of comments that you would like to leave in closing? My advice to all my students, you know, you know confidence in yourself. Believe in what you believe. Because I've, I've said almost two or three times in this interview, you can do whatever you want to do if you really want to do it badly. So that's all, that has been my advice from day one. Because I try to live by that. I mean, I don't get, it's very easy to get upset. Very easy to get mad. Very easy to get pushed toward the negative. Focus on the positive. Uh, keep the Almighty in charge. And uh, life will be what you make. That's my, that's my philosophy and that's what I try to pass on to my youth. And I started at age four. A lot of times the parents would say, they're too young to understand that. No, they're not. Particularly now, these youngsters, Forty years beyond what they are anyway. So if we hold back, then we are hurting. And that's why I keep mentioning. I, I I just believe that's my belief that this is what I was put on earth to do. I still play. I still enjoy all these different things. But the teaching part, because it's, it's something that will last. I and mean, a student will remember you. Some of the things, all the things, sometimes with what you say to them. And you don't know what it means at that particular time. I mean, for example, the two of you. I mean, I had no idea when I was, when you were coming through my tutoring, as people call it. Um, I said the things that I believe, and I believe the things that I said. And if just one thing touched you, my goal is accomplished. Christmas in 1969.
I'm sitting in front of Sumner High School with Deborah Cohen, and she pointed out to me that Noel is Leon spelled backwards. Noel, Noel, the angels will sing. Yeah. And I also like to thank you for helping me discover myself as a musician and playing in the stage band and going to all those festivals and, and all that stuff like that. It was really a fun time for us and everything. It was a trying time in some ways, but it was fun. Mr. Brady, little did I know that when I walked into your classroom in 1972, it would be the start of my career. And I just want to say thank you for being a great teacher and an inspiration to me. Thank you. Do you remember in 1974 you gave me some cheese and crackers to take on the road with me? Little did I know that when I got to Honolulu on my first stop, I ate those cheese and crackers that night. Well, today I carry on the tradition and uh, I give cheese and crackers to my students before I send them on the road. Thank you for being an inspiration to me. Mr. Brady, this is Felicia. I just wanted to thank you for the years of education and music, but more than that, you didn't just teach us music. You taught us to understand and appreciate and use music in every day of our lives. Also, you taught us character, and that is something that we will have with us the rest of our lives, and we will also instill that in our children and for future generations in the Kansas City area and across the United States. Music has benefited from you because you have probably produced more professional musicians than any music teacher in the entire world. And for that, I thank you, and I wish you the best of luck forever. Mr. Leon Brady, I can't say enough about you. Um, I want to tell you thank you very much for what you have done in our community, and it's been an honor to perform and play with your students and Thank you very much. Mr. Brady, what's going on? Thanks to you, I am an accomplished musician and I appreciate you for that. What can I say that I know that as I look back on my life and I think back of all the opportunities I had, I know that it was all ordained by God. For all those 22 musicians that went to Paris, it was all known from the beginning of the time that I would be one under your leadership. I've enjoyed you. I think very highly of you and I'll treasure you for the rest of my life as far as the musical ability, the professionalism I learned. And now I'm passing it on to students when I'm working with my own piano students daily. And so I want to just say thank you for all the things that you did, and the times you beat my tail, <laughs> and the times that you had me running around that track because of, you taught me how to discipline myself and how to discipline my students. So I appreciate that because it's made me be a very professional musician. I have more jobs now than I can almost handle. Mr. Brady, thank you, sir, for everything you've done for me, 40 plus years. Uh, you've been uh, like a stepping stone in the community. Uh, you never cease to amaze me. And you continue to move forward and God bless you. Hey, Mr. Brady, Fred Powell at you. I'd like to uh, express my gratitude for all the things that you have uh, influenced me to do over the years. Thank you for uh, directing me the right way to go to school and, and everything. And I uh, appreciate all the uh, knowledge that you had distributed me and all the things you have done for uh, to influence the community after uh, my departure. Right on, Mr. Brady. Thank you very much. Hey, Mr. Brady, how you doing? This is well-deserved and uh, long out of due for you. I just want to thank you for everything, for everything that you taught me in music and uh, some of the jazz band, the marching band, the orchestra. But I got a confession to make. Uh, a couple of times when in the jazz band, when I was time to do my part, I really memorized it. I wasn't reading, but uh, I think I did pretty good, don't you? So 
So I, I appreciate it and uh, best wishes to you. You know, Unless you are somebody like you, Mr. Brady, I can't even begin to tell you how much of an inspiration you've been to so many of us and, and continue to be. I mean, this I don't even know what to say. I'm a father. I, I deal with six kids that I'm trying to show the way you show hundreds of us. I mean, a complete generation. Thanks for being you. And I got to tell you, Mr. Brady, I never told you this. Out of all the years we've known each other, I've never told you this. but. When we were in high school, you were at Lincoln. Yeah. No, you were at Senate. Something. Yeah, he was at something. We were at Lincoln. I have to tell you, I hated you. <laughs> I hated you then because <laughs> our oh, band yeah. was your rival and yeah. we never won. Never, never. No. no but I started liking you after you retired. <laughs> and you had us over there. And I got to say, what you have taught me, I teach my students. Thanks a bunch. Thanks, Mr. Brady. Love him. At this time, I'd like to say thank you as one of the youngest members to go to Paris for the experiences, the, the knowledge, the just everything about me. Mr. Brady, this is long overdue. The tribute has been paid to you. You're worth it. No one's gave back to the community more than you have or even attempted to. I raise a glass, a toast to you, Mr. Brady. Thanks for the wonderful years. Mark Stafford out. Okay. Mr. Brady, thanks so much for giving a poor boy from the projects a chance. You believed in me when nobody else would. Thanks a lot. Hello, Mr. Brady. Uh, when I was growing up, I was on 11th Street. The west side had to go to Wyandotte. The east side went to Sumner. So I was kind of upset I didn't get to go to Sumner. But as I was growing up, I would come over and talk to you, and you always gave me the respect that you wouldn't expect an adult to give a, you know, a kid growing up. And i like to say thank you, and I appreciate you, know, you doing things for me, just musically and just as a role model. Mr. Brady, I wasn't one of your students. I went to wind out instead of summer and I'm still kicking myself. This is Donald Brown of the Bloodstones. I want to say thanks for all that you're doing, the marvelous things that you've done in the community. Keep on doing what you're doing. God bless you. Peace. Mr. Brady, Richard Wilson here. Just wanted to say thank you for all the years that you put up with me at Sumner. Not that it was that many of I me, mean, it was only three. I mean, I went right through like everybody else that you tr that you trained or helped train. Uh, I want to thank you for taking a chance on me when I came up to you and said I wanted to play bass because I wanted to be in the stage band. A violinist or whatever, a singer, but not a bass player, you told me that you would take a chance on me. I want to thank you for allowing me to play with the band and for going to Paris, for teaching me the values that you that you taught me. Um, in my student teaching, I've used a lot of the things that I learned this summer in helping some kids up in Minnesota where I went to school and up in Portland where I lived for a while. So again, I just want to say thank you for being the man that you are and for being the man that you will always be. Thank you. Now that's a part of one of Mr. Brady's favorite songs, Little Darling. I better stop now while I'm ahead. Well anyway, Mr. Brady, naturally he's my teacher and he's one of the few people that he gets no back talk out of me. What he wants me to do, he'll tell me and I'll say yes. So that's all right, like right now. But down through the years, Mr. Brady's helped me out tremendously by helping me continue in music. So Mr. Brady, I love you, and we do too, and we're gonna keep this music going. That's all. Mr. Brady, the one thing you taught me that has stuck with me, other than the rudiments, etc., is that music is a discipline. And I have taken that throughout my life 
it has been the number one focus for me in the real estate business. And I have learned that when you practice, you get good. And I have practiced and practiced and practiced. Thank you so very much. I shall ever, ever be in your debt. God bless you real good. Assalamu alaikum. That means I greet you in peace. I know that sounds foreign. Nevertheless, that's where I am now. However, Mr. Brady, I want to thank you for all the things that you've done in the community, all the things that you've done for us as musicians, because what you instilled in us, I, I remember to this day, that word R-E-S-P-O-N-S-I-B-I-L-I-T-Y. I remember that being the biggest, one of the biggest words that we were going to learn in our life. So I appreciate that because it has taught me to uh, pass that on to others and share with them that it's just not something that you are assigned to do or an instruction that's given. You have to complete ideas and be responsible for the whole thing. So that's something that I really learned from you and I really appreciate it. Uh, and foremost, of course, music. The gift of music that you allow me to uh, experience from you, just wonderful. I want to thank you and I hope this is a grand occasion for you and that you really enjoy yourself. Assalamu alaikum. How you doing, Mr. Brady? Reginald, as you say, one of the few people who calls me Reginald. Um, certainly, I got to give you credit to my first year at Southeast Middle and uh, Northeast High School. I'm indebted to you because you were responsible solely for the first middle school band at Southeast Middle School in Kansas City. I had a middle school band. Mr. Brady uh, informed me about some band uniforms that Northeast Junior used to have in Kansas City, Kansas. To make a long story short, we were able to get those uniforms and form the, uh, one of the first middle school bands in Kansas City, Missouri. I used to work with Mr. Brady for about eight to 10 years at Brady's and Sons on Minnesota. So Mr. Brady, I'm indebted to you, you are a true soldier. And I always remind the kids that at this point, uh, Slago was perceived to be on top, but they need to know their history that Sumner High School is where it was at. I know it's not the proper grammar, but we know that you were the real deal. I've accomplished a lot here at Slago, but I've yet to take that international trip. And that is how I want to go on top, just like Mr. Brady. Thank you. Well, one of the first things I want to say about Mr. Brady is uh, just a great big thank you uh, for, uh, first of all, teaching, uh, putting up and having patience um, with not only me but I guess all of us you know uh, I was privileged enough to have him as an instructor teacher mentor from the seventh grade all the way to my senior year at some high school um, he really exposed us and me to a lot of different areas of music not just one particular segment of music but classical jazz um, you know uh, how orchestra really works how our stage band really works how the inner workings all those pieces come together and make one good sound it's just not one individual you know when I was you know as a kid you, you hear that one horn and one voice he taught us how that one voice was supported by all the other parts and people in the, in the group. In your community, you learn how to deal with your community. Coming out of your community, like we had, a, like we did when we went to KU Music Camp, we had a chance to meet kids from all over the country, all over the country, from all states, um, or a lot of different states. And uh, because of that, uh, you find other people that have similar problems, different problems, uh, different tastes, different things, but you all come together under one roof when it comes to uh, the band we were in. Like we had concert bands, to, uh, you had a stage band. Uh, it was just um, it was just really nice to go to KU, uh, get that experience of being on a campus, one of the largest campuses around, um, meeting people from all over the country. Because of that, um, it made me a better person, a, uh, a person that understood people better and gave me a world look, a world view, an overview of the world better. 
I guess I should say, um, just really appreciate it. Without Mr. Brady, it never would happen. And uh, all I can say is thank you, and more thank you. And it's really appreciated. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one. Travis Gaetan, I'm 12, and what I think, what I think about Mr. Brady is, he's a good teacher, and he helps us on anything we need help with, and he makes sure we, we have it right before we move on, and and he sets a good, uh, he sets a good example for us, and and he teach, he teaches us anything we have trouble on, and. We mess up on. Okay. Um, Mr. Brady um, is nice and he helps us. And if we don't know where the page is, he tells us where it is. And he's fun and he asks us if we practice. So if we, if some people don't know, um, they can. If they don't have the paper, um, they don't have to play, or they can just follow along if they don't know it. Thank you, Mr. Brady. Are you back? Is it doing in the back? <laughs> it's just going right now. It's recording, so or whatever. Oh, you recording? Yeah, yeah, so we're just getting one. <laughs> yeah. What's that? <laughs> Craig Lindsay, class of 74. <laughs> Yeah, he's the one, he's the one, it's the man producing it, right? Friday, 2015. 